Jeffries, thank you so much. All right. Thanks for allowing me to talk. Oh, we're very glad to have you. Thank you. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, it's showing now. Thanks. Great. Okay. So I thought we might start out with just a few questions just as an educational opportunity, and then we'll dive more into LVNC and try and leave some time at the end for questions. So the first question is about why we call this non-compaction. So compaction is a normal process that occurs uh, in embryogenesis, and compaction of the left ventricle occurs at one of these times, and you can just keep these numbers in mind. We'll answer the questions at the end of the talk. The most common mode of genetic inheritance in left ventricular non-compaction is either X-linked recessive autosomal recessive autosomal dominant or mitochondrial. We'll talk about that. Most consistent predictor of morbidity, so uh, people feeling sick or in mortality in LVNC is related to the uh, non-compacted to compacted ratio, the involvement of, of segments of the left ventricle, a family history of LVNC or an LVF of less than 40%, which is LV ejection fraction. And then lastly, left ventricular non-compaction is recognized internationally as a primary genetic cardiomyopathy, true or false. <clears throat> So when we talk about genetically triggered cardiomyopathies, there are five types that we typically refer to. One is dilated, which is a common um, hypertrophic restrictive cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, and then the topic of our talk today, left ventricular non-compaction. And it was first described in 1984, and it's really uh, the initial presentations were back in 1926 when people noticed that the heart muscle itself looked kind of spongy appearing as opposed to being nice and solid and homogeneous. Um, since then, there's been increasing amounts of published data, and the diagnosis has really important implications on the management and then needed family screening for patients who are at risk. LBNC has been primary, classified as a primary cardiomyopathy with a genetic origin. Consideration of acquired disease and unfavorable remodeling or changes in the ventricle have, always, have also been reported in the literature. What we're talking about here is that there's a morphologic sort of change in the way the left ventricle looks, uh, and it's composed of a severely thickened two-layered myocardium with numerous prominent trabeculations or finger-like processes, and then deep intertrabecular recesses. And it's clinic clinically and genetically a very heterogeneous disease. And the way I describe it to patients oftentimes is if you were in a cave, the stalagmites, the things that sort of jut out of the floor, those finger-like projections are kind of what we see in the setting of non-compaction. Okay. Hmm, my slides aren't advancing for some reason. Uh, there we go. Um, so during cardiac development, um, myocardi the myocardium is initially very trabeculated. So there are a lot of these finger-like projections in all babies when they're developing in utero. And this is a period just before coronary development. There's an adaptation to provide uh, extra coronary blood flow to the developing heart muscle. And the development of this coronary vasculature is associated at the same time with the loss of these trabeculations or these finger-like processes. So between the gestational ages of about five to eight weeks, these trabeculae regress. They sort of fold together and then fold over. And that's the process of compaction. And that's what happens in a normal heart. When that doesn't happen, then that is representative of what we would call left ventricular non-compaction. And this is kind of a de depiction of how the, so we talk about this spongiform appearance, kind of looks like a, a honeycombing appearance. And the, up in the top left is uh, at six weeks when you have a lot of trabeculations. And then you can appreciate those trabeculations decrease when you get closer to eight weeks. And at the end of the fetal period, all of those trabeculations or those honeycombing sort of appearances are all gone. And this is the way the normal myocardium looks on the periphery here. So LVNC was previously thought to be a very rare form of cardiomyopathy, but there's increased awareness and improvements in the diagnosis uh, that we use for imaging. And this has re resulted in more cases being reported. So LVNC accounts for about 9% of newly diagnosed pediatric cardiomyopathies, and the prevalence of LVNC in all adult echocardiograms is reported to be about 0.05%, uh, which is quite a bit when you consider the number of echocardiograms that are done in the United States each day. 
So LVNC, um, it may present in infancy. It can present it, you know, the diagnosis can be made at any age simply because this is a congenital defect. It's something that you're born with. And often this will be in the setting of decompensated heart failure when we see it in an infant. However, many patients do not present until later in life. These patients may have evidence of symptoms consistent with heart failure, arrhythmias, or thromboembolic disease, meaning um, throwing clots, uh, which would be uh, evidence of something like a stroke. But many patients never have any symptoms whatsoever. Um, LVNC itself can be seen in association with structural congenital heart disease, so holes in the heart or other abnormal plumbing uh, findings that shouldn't be there that are congenital in nature. And LVNC may also be seen with other what we would call concomitant cardiomyopathy phenotypes. So it could have, in the setting of LVNC, you could have normal squeeze and normal size of the ventricle itself. The heart muscle could be dilated and dysfunctional, so it doesn't squeeze very well. It could be thickened or hypertrophic, so it doesn't relax very well. It could be restrictive, so meaning that the heart muscle itself doesn't relax very well and the top chambers of the atria become dilated. Or it could have a mixed picture of many of these all combined into one sort of physiologic state where you may have a ventricle that's dilated and not squeezing very well, but the heart walls could be very thickened. And this is just some uh, depictions of a patient who has a ventricular septal defect here, so a hole between two bottom, bottom pumping chambers, but also has LV and C because of these deep trabeculations uh, and recesses that I was talking about, those finger-like processes you can see on the, out here on the periphery. And then this is also a patient here with what's called Epstein's anomaly. So a valve that usually lives here is just placed down towards the apex of the heart. But you can also see here those deep recesses and those finger-like projections, uh, which are very characteristic of someone with non-compaction. And this is a slide that shows those concomitant phenotypes that I was talking about earlier, where you have this, what we would call isolated LVNC, so the size and the squeeze of the heart are normal, but we see these deep, uh, we see the trabeculations and the deep recesses. This is one where the ventricle itself is dilated and not squeezing very well, but you can also see those trabeculations. This is one where the heart muscle is thickened. So once again, you can see the trabeculations, but also thickening of the heart muscle. Um, this is one where uh, you see uh, sort of a combination of things where you see the dilation of the ventricle and a little bit of thickening of the ventricle as well. Down here, we see evidence of what we would call restrictive cardiomyopathy. So we see these top chambers, the atria that are very enlarged, but also someone who has these trabeculations. And then um, lastly, we see someone who has uh, non-compaction both on the left side of the heart, which is this side, um, as well as on the right side of the heart as well, which is over here. So this is what's called biventricular non-compaction. So the genetics behind the disease, we're still trying to understand and learn more about. Um, but we know um, from some old data that uh, um, there were some reports on patients with LVNC where genetic sequencing was done. And there were nine distinct mutations that were identified, seven of which were in a gene called beta mice and heavy chain, uh, which is a common, what we would call sarcomeric gene, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. One was in alpha cardiac actin, and then one was in uh, cardiac troponin. So these sarcomeric proteins or muscle uh, proteins that make up the heart muscle itself are found in this study are also implicated in the development of things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy, and dilated cardiomyopathy. So this suggests that there's maybe a continuum of cardiomyopathy with variable phenotypic uh, presentations, and it supports the role of normal sarcomeric or muscle development function in, in overall cardiac development. And this is just a cartoon presenting some of the proteins that can be abnormal or damaged in the setting of non-compaction. So we talked a little bit about troponin uh, and uh, myosin binding protein C, and here's that beta myosin heavy chain that we were talking about. But all of these, if there's a mutation in the gene that encodes these proteins, can result in LV and C. Uh, so those are things that when we do genetic testing, we try and look at. And these are some of the genes that have been associated with LVNC and some of their overlap uh, 
So you can see LV and C can oftentimes be associated with holes in the heart that shouldn't be there, other types of cardiomyopathies, and then other congenital abnormalities, as well as some rhythm disturbances, which are Brugada syndrome and Romano Ward syndrome. And these are some of the genes listed up at the top that have been associated with LV and C and these particular findings. So, and some of these are genes that are in those sarcomeric genes that we were talking about, so the structural protein genes. This gene is actually an important gene for uh, heart rhythm abnormalities. So when it's abnormal, you can see that it can cause LV and C, but it can also cause problems with the electrical system of the heart down here with the Brugada syndrome and Romano Ward syndrome. And these are some of the uh, breakdowns of the genes that when we look at them that are responsible for LV and C. And you can appreciate that that beta myosin heavy chain is the one that seems to comprise the most. I can tell you right now, we probably know about 30 or 40 percent of the genes that are involved. So there's still a lot of work for us to do to try and figure out exactly what's going on with the disease. And um, these are some data that show, so these are cardiac MRI pictures, and this is the left ventricle going across here. And what we've found, and we just recently published this information, is that the more mutations or changes in the genetic material you have, the more likely you are to develop a worse case of LV and C. So here would be a normal heart with no case, no mutations that were found. Here's one with one mutation. When we start to see some of those finger-like projections and those recesses, here's one with two, and you can appreciate here that honeycombing effect that we were talking about. And then here with someone with three who has pretty dramatic involvement that wraps around the heart, and you can appreciate here on what's called a cross-sectional view that there are a lot of those deep recesses and a lot of these trabeculations that are evident. So those are things that we would pay attention to. And it may be the more genetic involvement you have, the more likely you are to have a worse case of the disease. There are criteria for diagnosing LV and C, and most of these are done with echocardiography or ultrasound of the heart. So uh, Jenny uh, was an author back in 2001 who proposed some diagnostic criteria. And they said that there should be a lack of coexisting cardiovascular abnormalities. There should be segmental thickening, like we talked about, where you have that thin epicardial layer and a thicker non-compacted endocardial layer. And then there's an actual ratio where we compare that compacted ratio and non-compacted ratio. And if that's greater than two, that's felt to be diagnostic of someone having LVNC. And then we try and see the presence of color Doppler blood flow, so blood flowing out from between the heart. And I'll show you some pictures going out towards the surface of the heart. Um, these are some more diagnostic criteria, so the Jenny criteria, the ones that we just talked about. Um, and then there are cardiac MRI um, uh, uh, data as well um, that um, Uh, that have uh, been used when we do MRI, and you can see that the cutoffs are a little bit different, where uh, as opposed to using 2 to 1 as a ratio, we actually use 2.3 to 1, looking at these non-compacted to compacted ratios. So the location of the non-compacted segments also is important. It's usually located in the apex or the tip of the heart, but it could be in the mid-lateral regions or in the mid-inferior regions. And the non-compacted segments often are hypocontractile, so that means that they don't squeeze exactly normally. Other findings that we might see in ultrasound may be a, a drop in the way the heart squeezes or what call, what's called the ejection fraction, the diastolic dysfunction or the ability of the heart to relax. We may see abnormal LV papillary muscles, so these are the, the cords that attach the mitral valve to the wall of the heart itself. And then we also maybe see the presence of thrombi or clots that develop in those little finger-like uh, recesses that we've been showing you. And this is just an echocardiographic picture that you can see those deep recesses going down. So all this black stuff where it should all be white, like this up here is normal heart muscle. And you can appreciate there are these kind of holes in the heart muscle where blood could flow down in here out towards the surface of the heart.
and this is cutting the heart in a cross section. And once again, you can see very similar findings where you see those recesses, these black holes that are kind of like little caverns that allow for blood to go from the inside of the pumping chamber out towards the outside of the heart. And this is the way that we can we do that calculation that I was talking about when it comes to the ratio. So um, what we do is actually measure the non-compacted piece. So that would be like from here to here on the on an ultrasound test. And then we would look at what was called the compacted layer, which is this layer here. And then we compare these two. And you can appreciate um, that the amount of non-compacted or the thickened layer of the heart muscle itself is much larger than that compacted ratio. And the ratio here is probably close to about four to one. So this patient would definitely meet criteria for having LV non-compaction. And this is just a nice cartoon making it a little bit easier to understand what we're trying to measure when we do these non-compacted to compacted ratios. And this is the way that we were talking about putting color Doppler so we can see how the blood is flowing by using Doppler technology. And you can appreciate here that blood is flowing out into the heart of the myocardium where it should all be nice and solid. Blood should be contained in the pumping chamber itself. It actually flows down into those crypts and recesses. And you can see that happening here as well with the heart muscle, where there's blood getting out into those little cavernous regions inside the heart muscle itself. Sometimes we can't see the pictures exceptionally well, so sometimes we'll give contrast agents to help us to better depict these finger-like processes. And this is someone who got a contrast agent, so an intravenous agent that was given to help us to better delineate the left ventricle. And by doing so, you can see those big finger-like processes uh, jutting out. So this patient, couldn't, this was a confirmed diagnosis of LDNC by giving this contrast agent. We can also use cardiac MRI to help us to better understand what LVNC looks like. And we can actually use this to measure that non-compacted ratio to the compacted ratio. And this was about 4.7 to 1. So that means that this layer is about 4.7 times thicker than the compacted ratio, uh, which is uh, represented by the letter C on this particular slide. So MRI gives us wonderful pictures, gives us very accurate uh, delineation of where the non-compaction is occurring, and we can measure very reliably where we, what we think that those ratios are to help us to establish the diagnosis. The other thing that we can see with MRI is that we give a contrast agent called gadolinium, and we can look for scar or damage to the heart muscle, and we actually see that here in this, where there are some changes where it should all be nice and black, like you see here on this view. Over here, there are some white uh, regions or segments, and those are re uh, evidence or markers of having damage to the heart muscle or scar. And you can imagine that that's important simply because that might impact the overall squeeze of the heart, but it also may some have some impacts on if the heart uh, is prone to having unusual heart rhythms or dysrhythmias. So these are all important things that we can garner for a, from a cardiac MRI. So cardiac MRI can be diagnostic for LVNC, give us very accurate chamber measurements, can give us very accurate non-compacted to compacted ratio measures, and it can also give us the scar tissue assessment. And we've been able to see that, uh, that the ejection fraction very much is associated with how much scar you have. So the more scar you have in your heart muscle, the less likely it is that your heart squeeze will be normal. So that's an important finding for us and something that we track over time to see if you're having increases in the amount of scar that can be measured by MRI. And this is a different way of looking at an MRI. This is in cross section, so it kind of looks like a donut. Inside the red is where the blood would be, where the pumping chamber exists. And then out here are all these, the trabeculations that we were talking about are the non-compacted regions where the heart itself is not uh, morphologically normal. Uh, and this is just a different way of characterizing how the heart muscle looks by using cardiac MRI. We can also do MRI to look for areas of scar muscle, uh, uh, scar in the heart muscle itself without giving contrast. So there's a thing called T1 mapping, and sometimes this is important for patients to not receive gadolinium because maybe their kidney function isn't completely normal. We can give, uh, we can actually look by the MRI, so these 
uh, when we don't give contrast, we're looking at uh, what's called LG negative. So we're doing a special sequence to look for the non-compacted ratio. You can appreciate here that there's some scar tissue that's uh, where it should be nice and purplish blue all the way around. There are some yellow and orange areas that are interspersed in the heart muscle itself. And this is confirmed once we give uh, the contrast agent, which is called gadolinium, and this is, stands for late gadolinium enhancement. You can see that the pictures are very similar, meaning that we can, clarif we can quantify the amount of scar tissue we think that we're seeing um, without having the contrast, which sometimes is very beneficial to patients because that way they don't have to have an IV. So left ventricular non-compaction has some important aspects to it. The clinical manifestations, it can present as heart failure, it can present as thromboembolic events or what would, you know, what would be called strokes or TIAs. It can have arrhythmias or unusual heart rhythms and then it can present a sudden cardiac death. So it's an important thing for us to understand and pay attention to. And these are some of the clinical characteristics of patients that have had left ventricular non-compaction in multiple studies. So one by Chen, by Achita, Exelon, Pignatelli, Wall, Murphy, Lafiego, Aris, Lilji, and Stanton. And you can see down here at the bottom the complications, and these are the important things. And heart failure is a very common complication in heart failures when we're talking about where the blood can't be delivered adequately to the tissues, and that results in things like swelling, fatigue, uh, different kinds of findings <clears throat> that make patients feel uncomfortable and, and impact their quality of life. They can have ventricular tachycardia or unusual heart rhythms, which may be lethal. They can have these embolic events, so those potential for stroke or TIAs. They could have a cardiovascular death, so a sudden death, and we've seen that in a few of the patients. And some of them actually have to ultimately go on to a need for a heart transplant, which happens in a handful of the patients that are represented by these studies. Um, this is a study that we did a few years ago where we looked when I was in Texas, where we looked at a large group of patients with left ventricular non-compaction to try and understand what were the predictors of a bad outcome in the form of mortality and sudden death. And we found that LVNC had a high mortality rate and was strongly associated with unusual heart rhythms in children, also preceding cardiac dysfunction, so the ability of the heart to squeeze, or ventricular arrhythmias or ventricular uh, uh, bad heartbeats were associated with an increased risk in mortality. However, we also noted children with normal cardiac dimension, so if the size of the heart was normal and the heart squeeze was normal, the risk for having a bad outcome such as sudden death was exceptionally low. So what we did is looked at all the data in our institution, uh, and we looked for patients who had what's called systolic dysfunction. So that's when we see the heart squeeze being below normal, which is below 55%. And then we look for the thickness of the heart muscle, which is defined as greater than two Z scores, which are kind of like standard deviations. And then dilation of the left ventricle, which would be greater than two Z scores or two standard deviations. We found 242 patients with LVNC, and 62 of these patients are a quarter presented with signs and symptoms of heart failure. So once again, that inability of the heart to deliver adequate blood and oxygen to the tissues. And then about 17% presented with arrhythmias or suspected arrhythmias. So they had documented abnormal heartbeats or they had a strong suspicion of documented uh, abnormal heartbeats. About 13% of these patients died and about 6% were transplanted ultimately. 150 patients or over half presented with or uh, developed cardiac dysfunction over time. So they either had heart squeeze abnormalities at the beginning, or as we followed them over time, they developed heart squeeze abnormalities. And there were electrocardiographic or ECG abnormalities that were present in almost 90% of the cases. And these were usually findings that the heart muscle was thickened or hypertrophied, or a problem with the way that the heart resets itself, which is called repolarization. 80 patients had arrhythmias or unusual heartbeats. 42 patients had ventricular tachycardia, and that can be a lethal heart rhythm, so that's an important one for us to know about. Five patients had aborted sudden cardiac death, so uh, were resuscitated or came out of it on their own. And then 12 patients had what's called unexplained syncope, so they passed out and we didn't know why. <clears throat> 
and then there were about 15 cases or 6.2 percent of, uh, of sudden cardiac death in total in the cohort. The presence of cardiac dysfunction or heart squeeze abnormality was strongly associated with overall mortality. And then these findings with the way that the heart resets itself, these repolarization abnormalities were also associated with increased mortality. And then the presence of unusual heart rhythms was also associated with, with mortality. So all important predictors and things that we should be looking for when we see patients with LV and C in the clinic. And these are the ways that the patients presented to us in this study. About a quarter, like we said, had evidence of heart failure. So congestive heart failure is what that stands for. Some had abnormal cardiac exams, such as a murmur, for example. Some had an abnormal electrocardiogram, and then some had screening echoes that were found to be abnormal in nature. But you could appreciate here, this is what's called a Kaplan-Meier curve, and this blue line represents patients that kept their heart function in a normal range, and the green line represents patients where their heart muscle function deteriorated over time, and this depicts overall survival. So basically, patients that developed no ventricular dysfunction or no squeeze abnormalities, their survival was built really much that of the general population, whereas those are the patients that developed heart muscle squeeze problems actually had an increased chance of overall mortality. And these are years of follow-up. So at two years, that would mean that uh, around 85% or so of the patients were still alive. So that means about 15% may have passed away because of complications from their LVNC. When we look out to 10 years, that's even closer to something like 65%. So it's an important finding, one that needs to be taken into account when you're taking care of patients with LVNC. So we know that nearly all patients with sudden cardiac death had abnormal cardiac dimensions or cardiac dysfunction or heart squeeze abnormalities. And there were no mortalities that were observed in patients with normal cardiac dimensions and, heart, and normal heart squeeze without any preceding arrhythmias. So these are important things. So when you come to see us in clinic and we tell you that your heart squeeze is normal and you don't have any arrhythmias, we typically would not restrict those patients and allow them to do the things that they want to do, such as competitive sports. And this is uh, very similar data to what's been found in adults, where patients that preserve their cardiac function or their heart squeeze have a very similar uh, outcome to the general population, which is represented by all these dots, whereas those patients that have evidence of, of heart squeeze abnormalities over time actually have a much less survival than those that have preserved systolic function. So the management of LVNC is really directed at the cardiac phenotype, and there are variable phenotypes that can present in childhood. And these are the ways that we assess for what's going on. But um, we look, use things like echocardiography. We use cardiac MRIs you've seen pictures of. We do genetic testing and neurologic assessments to look for myopathies. We do family screening to look at first-degree relatives, so that would be parents, siblings, and offspring. We do electrophysiology studies like EKGs to see if there have been any unusual heart rhythms. And then the therapeutic strategies is that we would usually, um, if people have normal size and function, we would continue to follow them. But if they had evidence of heart squeeze abnormalities, then we would talk about putting those, pati uh, those patients on medical therapy to try and help with the heart squeeze things like ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. And then we also consider things like anticoagulation, especially in patients that have a, a heart squeeze or an ejection fraction that's less than 40%. Some patients we use uh, what's called an implantable cardioverter defibrillator and ICD. And those are in patients that often that have presented with sudden cardiac death or unexplained syncope. We would talk about using an ICD as a potential life-saving mechanism and then also for primary prevention in some patients who we think are at high risk, we would put the ICD in before they had evidence of uh, an abnormality just to be uh, proactive. And then sometimes we do what's called biventricular pacing or cardiac resynchronization therapy. And we use that in patients where that ejection fraction number is less than 35%. And then they have evidence that the heart squeeze is not in a, what's called a synchronous fashion. So they usually have evidence of a thing called the left bundle branch block. And these are the ways that we follow the dips, different types of cardiomyopathies. And we'll look at LVNC 
Um, if we do genetic testing and the clinical testing is negative, we often do follow up at least every three years, and we actually do it a little more frequently in our center. We'll often see patients every one to two years. If there's a screening mutation, so we know that the patient harbors an abnormal gene that's causative of the disease, then we would see yearly in childhood and then every one to three years in adulthood to follow the way that their heart muscle looks and to look for heart rhythm abnormalities. So going back to the questions that we had, um, we had left ventricular non-compaction. Compaction of the left ventricle occurs at, and if you were listening, we talked about it was at five to eight weeks of gestation. So that's when all that honeycombing starts to disappear. We start seeing thickening of the heart muscle and, and where it becomes very distinct as a one-layered myocardium as opposed to having two layers, which is what we see in the setting of non-compaction. The most common mode of genetic inheritance, and we didn't talk a lot about inheritance, but I'll explain a little bit, is that it's an autosomal dominant phenomenon. And that means that if you carry a gene that is responsible for this disease, you have a 50-50 chance of passing it on to your offspring. X-linked recessive is something that we would see in boys and then in some females. Uh, that's characteristic of diseases of something like Barth syndrome, for example. Autosomal recessive means you need two abnormal copies of the gene, so you would get one abnormal copy from your mom and one abnormal copy from your dad. And then mitochondrial genes, which are passed down from mom to son or daughter because uh, mitochondria are the little powerhouses of the cells, uh, come from the, uh, the mom's side and are passed on to the, uh, on to the offspring. Um, the most consistent predictor of morbidity and mortality in isolated LVNC, um, so non-compacted -compact ratio is not the right answer, even though it may have some impact on overall morbidity. Involvement of all the segments doesn't seem to be a big predictor, so you can have diffuse involvement and it doesn't seem to have as big of an impact. A family history of LVNC is important, but it also, once again, is not a major predictor of morbidity or mortality. But the big one is the heart squeeze, like we've been talking about throughout the lecture, and that if you had an ejection fraction that was less than 40%, that would be a very strong predictor of morbidity and mortality in the setting of LVNC. And then lastly, left ventricular non-compaction is recognized internationally as a primary genetic cardiomyopathy. The answer is false. There's still some debate in Europe and other places where the uh, LVNC should be classified as a distinct cardiomyopathy or one that, that's on its own or by itself, or is it just a part and parcel with some of the other types of cardiomyopathy? We personally believe that it's a distinct type of cardiomyopathy, and so we classify it as such in the United States, and that's the way that I treat it in clinical practice. So. LVNC itself is associated with significant morbidity and mortality. Um, myocardial dysfunction or heart squeeze abnormalities and clinically significant arrhythmias or unusual heartbeats are predictors of outcome. Um, there are some standard therapies for other cardiomyopathies that, that appear to be very reasonable for LVNC. So, for example, if you have LVNC and your heart squeeze is not completely normal, the use of things like ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, angiotensin receptor blockers, some of the traditional medications that I'm sure you know people that are on those types of medications actually seem to make a difference in LVNC, and we recently published some data to show that you can get very good responses from those medications, but you need to be in a place where they're actually looking for LVNC to know to be able to detect when the heart muscle function isn't completely normal, and then to know when to institute those kinds of therapies. Um, we know LVNC is a clinically and, and genetically heterogeneous type of cardiomyopathy, and it may present in isolation or it may present in association with congenital heart disease, but it's a very important type of cardiomyopathy that we're seeing more and more of simply because awareness is increasing. Even yet, though, today there are still a lot of cases that are missed on things like echocardiography or on cardiac MRI simply because patient, uh, people don't know exactly what to look for. So a lot of the time that I spend is about education and trying to increase awareness about the disease, simply because it can have a pretty important outcome. There are a lot of, there's a lot of mortality associated with non-compaction. 
and I think it's really important that patients with LVNC be cared for in an institution that's familiar with the disease, who can actually monitor the patient appropriately over time, can uh, put into place appropriate restrictions when needed, and then also obviously to screen at-risk family members, which is also a very important part of what we do. Um, recommendations that we have for LVNC, so patients with non-compaction should be screened and have continued monitoring for electrocardiographic changes, arrhythmias, and we would usually do that in the form of a Holter monitor and or doing a stress test, and then cardiac dysfunction or heart squeeze abnormalities. Uh, children and adolescents with cardiac um, dysfunction or unusual heart rhythm should be restricted from competitive athletics. And that's a question that we get a lot, and, and hopefully people understand that this is a moving target. So just because you see us today and you have normal heart squeeze and no evidence of arrhythmias doesn't mean that that's going to persist forever. So we have to pay close attention to that, and that's why these ongoing evaluations, including multiple tests like echocardiograms, MRIs, Holter, stress tests, EKGs are very important. And part of the workup as well may include genetic testing, uh, which gives us some insights into what the causative mechanism is for the, for the LVNC, but also gives us the opportunity to screen at-risk family members. So meaning if a patient came to see me and I saw that they carried a genetic abnormality in a gene that I thought was causative of the disease, we could use that information to screen their parents, their siblings, and then their offspring to see if that same genetic misspelling was evident. And if it were, then we can actually decide on whether we need to see the patient again or not. If they didn't have the mutation, then they wouldn't need to be seen uh, for additional follow-up. But if they did have the mutation, then we would need to be seeing them probably once a year just to make sure that we're not missing anything and doing the right kind of surveillance. And then we know patients with non-compaction and normal cardiac size and function without any unusual heart rhythms should be allowed to participate in activities without restrictions, but that all hinges on being followed over time. All first-degree relatives of patients with LVNC should undergo some type of cardiac screening, and it's not just a one-time screening. We would recommend, because of a family history, that they be followed longitudinally over time. Um, we need to be careful in the selection of NAMAS of, um, uh, uh, should be, uh, should a, a careful selection of non-invasive imaging modalities. We use a lot of cardiac MRI because it gives us those beautiful pictures that I was showing you earlier, and it gives us an opportunity to look for scar tissue, which we can't really see when we use traditional ultrasound uh, imaging. Um, we should consider genetic testing for patients with LVNC especially those patients with LVNC who have depressed squeeze or abnormal systolic function simply because the yield is a little bit higher in that group. And then, as I said, the cardiovascular management is really based on what we would call a phenotype. So what does the heart actually look like? Is it thickened and is there a blockage to blood flow getting out of the heart, which we would call a hypertrophic phenotype? We would use things like beta blockers to help us to slow down the heart and allow for blood to effectively get out of the heart. Um, if the heart squeezed with abnormal, we would use different types of medications like you heard about, like ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, to help us to try and make the heart squeeze better, but also change the geometry of the heart so it's in a more um, uh, efficient state. When I describe a dilated heart muscle, I usually describe it as like a basketball that's been cut in half. What happens is the heart becomes globular and it doesn't squeeze very well. What we're really trying to achieve what a normal heart looks like is sort of like a football that's been cut in half, so more of like a cone. And the medicines that we use help us to get from that basketball type to more of the football type. And that and that's called what we would say is favorable remodeling or changes in the way that the geometry of the heart actually presents itself. And so these medications can help us to do that. I think future directions that we need to pursue is that we continue to, to need to define more of the genetics of non-compaction. Uh, we need to further understand what the genetic implications, so what kind of specific genetic problem you have, what does that predict from what we would say is a phenotype or what is the heart gonna look like. We need to expand the understanding of phenotypic overlap with the other types of cardiomyopathies that we've alluded to. 
we need to define the optimal times for when to look and how to look, and then what are the best medications or need for pacemakers or defibrillators or surgery or whatever the case may be. What is the optimal ability to do that? And we don't know that at this point because uh, our understanding of the disease continues to evolve. And then we need to establish more definitive guidelines for screening, diagnosis, and management of LVNC just because, as I was telling you, some of the ways that these numbers are calculated, there's a little bit of debate about what number is an important number as a cutoff. We used on the ECHO using two to one as a cutoff, but maybe that's not sensitive enough. And then for MRI using 2.3 to one, that may not be adequate either. So we need more information about that to understand exactly what the right sort of cutoffs are for us to make the diagnosis. So with that, um, I think we uh, finished pretty much on time, and I wanted to open up uh, the, uh, the floor to, to questions, whatever we can answer up until 2 o'clock, and then I'd be happy to try and answer more questions um, after, uh, you know, via email or whatever through the CCF, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Jeffries. That was a great talk. Um, we do have a handful of questions. So, um, yeah, so I'll just jump into the first one. Um, are you able to diagnose LVNC in utero since compaction shows um, happen so early? Sometimes we can. That's a great question. Um, you have to remember the hearts are very small in utero, but yes, there are cases where we can see uh, abnormalities at the ventricle in utero. Um, if there were a concern like that where we may or maybe we're seeing something in utero, then the first thing we would do when the baby was delivered would be to do a, a, an echo on the baby, what's called a transthoracic echo, to see exactly whether those, if we were really guessing correctly, whether the patient had evidence of non-compaction or not. But there are cases that can be diagnosed in utero, and it definitely is there in utero. It's just sometimes hard to see based on the limitations of the technology. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another question asking about um, the NKY25 um, gene. Um, is it linked more to, towards an X-linked gene, or can you comment a little bit on, on what that is connected to? Yeah, let's see if I can get back to my gene slide. Um, so uh, NKX 2.5, you can see it's on here, um, can be associated with LVNC, but it, it also can be associated with other cardiomyopathies, but it's most typically associated with congenital or structural heart disease, so things like ventricular atrial septal defects, tetralogy of flow, and Epstein's anomaly. So um, oftentimes when we see that mutation, we would be seeing structural abnormalities of the heart, but also see evidence of non-compaction at the same time. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, is, is it important to know the specific patient's genetics to assess the patient's prognosis? We don't think so. Um, right now, we really use genetic information more as an opportunity to screen at-risk family members. Um, there are a couple of mutations that might be implicated. There's one like the LAM and A mutation, so the LMNA mutation is one that sometimes can be associated with unusual heart rhythms a little more aggressively than some of the other types of mutations. So those might be patients that ultimately might be at a higher risk for need for things like a pacemaker or a defibrillator. But for the most part, the reason we do genetic testing is not to inform how to treat the disease we use the way that the heart looks on MRI or echo to inform us about that. We really use it more about the opportunity to screen at-risk family members. So okay. once we get that positive result, we can draw blood on all the first-degree relatives and see if they have the mutation or not. And if they do, then those are patients that would need to be plugged into cardiology. And if they didn't, then they wouldn't need to be. Okay, thank you. Um, another question in, um, is, is it beneficial for other family members like grandparents, aunts, and uncles um, to also be screened for LVNC? So usually we try and go in a sequential manner. So if the first patient that came to me was a five-year-old, we would screen mom and dad. And then if we found an abnormality in mom or dad, uh, 
then we would screen the next generation, which would be their parents and their siblings as well. Um, we do screen sometimes patients that, um, you know, if we're seeing a five-year-old, sometimes we do screen the grandparents, but it really is the only way that it got to the patient itself is through one of their parents themselves. So that's usually where we start is with uh, the parents and the siblings. Okay, thank you. Um, is it possible to have an undulating phenotype? Can LVNC ever be acquired? Uh, so those are two separate questions. So yes, you can have an undulating phenotype where the heart can go from sort of a thin walled, uh, boggy structure like that basketball analogy I was giving you to more of a thickened heart muscle where it uh, squeezes very well and doesn't relax very well. So that's more of a hypertrophic phenotype. And then it can go back to what's called this dilated phenotype again. So that's what we mean by undulating, going from one cardiac phenotype to a different one and then back. Uh, and that has been reported. We reported that quite a few years ago uh, when we were in um, Houston. And then uh, the second question again, I'm sorry, was? If it could ever be acquired. Acquired, yeah. Those, so there are reports of acquired LVNC. Um, in pregnancy, for example, patients have been shown to uh, have a normal echocardiogram and then through the course of the pregnancy develop LVNC. It's also been reported in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy that over time, a relatively normal myocardium and that can de deteriorate into having findings of non-compaction. And then some people have reported seeing non-compaction after heart attack. So damage to the heart wall muscle itself could present with these trabeculations and recesses. So there are reports of acquired LVNC, but that by far is not the common way that we see the disease. The way we commonly see it is more of a genetic a genetically triggered type of disease. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, is it typical to see some degree of LVNC on an echo in young children under the age of one? What protocol would be in place for children who have a borderline diagnosis at a young age? Sure, so it definitely is possible to see it in younger kids. We would try to get as good of pictures as we possibly could. And those are patients that we would follow over time. We still use Sometimes we use a little less rigorous criteria for uh, younger patients, so maybe more of a, a 1.5 to 1 or a 1.7 to 1. But if we think the myocardium looks abnormal, we would continue to follow them over time. Um, ultimately, when they got old enough, we would probably do a cardiac MRI, which would give us the best pictures and give us the best chance to try and diagnose the disease. But we can definitely see it. And when we see it in kids less than one, that usually is a pretty – important finding because oftentimes that's associated with syndromes or other genetic abnormalities that um, can affect the rest of the body, other organ systems. So it's important to know simply because we may need to plug them in with other specialists to care for the patient. Okay, thank you. Do we know why arrhythmias happen with patients that have LVNC? Are there other markers to show that you may have a higher chance of having arrhythmias than other LVNC patients? Yeah, we think some of it's the genetics. So like I was on the screen that's on the, the slide that's on the screen right now, the SCN5A mutation and the HCN4 mutation are at the far right. Both of those are associated with heart rhythm abnormalities. So the SCN5A can be associated with a thing called long QT syndrome, which can lead to ventricular tachycardia. And then the HCN4 is associated with bradycardia or bradyarrhythmia, so slow heart rates. So we think that some of it has to do with the genetics. Um, we don't know all of the answers as to exactly why there are rhythm disturbances, but part of it probably is a scar tissue phenomenon. Part of it is because the heart muscle itself is just um, made abnormally, and so the ability of electricity to be conducted through the heart in a normal way is compromised. So all those things probably pay a, play a factor uh, into why uh, some patients have arrhythmias and, and why some patients don't. Okay, thank you. Um, have you ever seen a patient have LVNC and go through adulthood without having without going into heart failure um, and who has been asymptomatic? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, quite a large number of my patients actually who they never have any problems whatsoever. It's just a finding that we continue to pay attention to over time. But um, we have numerous patients that even in their 80s that have normal heart squeeze, 
normal heart size and don't have any heart rhythm abnormalities. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I think we might have time for maybe one or two more questions. So um, is there a way to clarify whether LVNC can be athlete's heart versus true cardiomyopathy? Yeah, um, MRI would be a nice way to do it if you really had a serious question about it. Um, the non-compaction would be very evident. Uh, athlete's heart is more of a thickened heart muscle, so more of what we would call a hypertrophied heart muscle. So it's not it's it's not really uh, we don't really get posed typically with the question of LVNC versus athlete's heart. It's more the question of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy versus athlete's heart. And so we can use advanced imaging techniques to look to see what the thickness of the heart muscle is for scar tissue. But we can also decondition those patients. So if they have athlete's heart and we had them stop doing their usual activities for three months or so, we should see the heart muscle get thinner over time if it's athlete's heart. If it doesn't, then that's indicative that there's probably some genetic reason that's driving the thickening. So it would be more likely that they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so we do have a few more questions in the queue, but um, I know that we're not going to be able to get through all of them. So if it's okay um, with you, Dr. Jeffries, I know you had offered to to um, to accept more questions via email, and then um, so we can communicate that way, and I can um, relay back his answers to everybody that um, has signed on to the webinar today. Um, if that if that is okay with with you, Dr. Jeffries. Sure, no, that would be fine. Okay, thank you so much. So for anyone who um, asked a question and it has not been answered, I have um, I have all of them still here. And um, so we'll go ahead and email those to Dr. Jeffrey and Jeffries and, um, and I will um, communicate those responses back to you. Um, but we wanted to, again, thank you so much for, for your time and expertise um, and joining us this afternoon. I think this is really informative and, um, you know, very, um, a very wonderful topic for our uh, members to be able to, to learn more about from you. So thank you again. Thanks for the opportunity and uh, look forward to future talks. Thank you so much. Take care and thanks everybody for joining. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.